we live in a cybernetic society. Cybernetics is about continuous data collection. It's a system that requires the continuous influx of information to inform the feedback loops it runs on. Those who program the algorithms can use these loops to alter all kinds of things. Feelings, thoughts, beliefs, behavior, and ultimately reality. The Chinese government has instituted a high-tech integrated data vacuuming social credit score system to continuously monitor the trustworthiness and obedience of its 1.4 billion citizens. China is creating a social credit system. It's a plan to regulate business and citizen behavior with various incentive schemes. The full nationwide rollout of which is expected next year. Each citizen will be tracked, rated, and then rewarded or punished by the government with the help of its high-tech corporate partners. China's State Council unveiled the plan in 2014, saying it would allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven, while make it hard for the discredited to take a single step. In Wired's article "Inside China's Vast New Experiment in Social Ranking," the social credit system is described succinctly. For the Chinese Communist Party, social credit is an attempt at a softer, more invisible authoritarianism. The goal is to nudge people toward behaviors ranging from energy conservation to obedience to the party. Social credit scores. Awards or remove points based on behavior. It's big data meets Big Brother. This will be a world with no more personal experiences, only transactions for the social credit system. This knows every person, every bike, every car, every bus. That's because it essentially turns every public interaction into a transaction, where points can be earned or lost. Imagine a society where everything you do, everything you say. And everything you buy is controlled and evaluated by the authorities. So now the government is tracking citizens' behavior, from smoking on a train to jaywalking. Massive centralized database makes it possible for authorities and some private companies to identify nearly anyone by capturing their face. If you do something bad, you get points docked. If you do something good and you happen to be spotted, you get a boost. Scores are docked for things like littering, a messy yard. Gossip. A person's reputation is scored on a scale of 350 to 950. The country already has an estimated 176 million cameras. Everywhere she goes, Oh Young Hao Yu is followed. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored to show how responsible and trustworthy she is. Yeah, yeah. They're going through people's chat histories, like on WeChat and stuff, to look for potential messages and stuff. 那么其实政府已经掌握了我们很多资料。然后政府方也掌握了一些我们个人信用，就比如说是否遵纪守法啊，以及我们的教育程度。那我觉得，如果把所有的大数据，那对我们来讲其实是更高效的。How you with a good score of 752 is okay with it? Most people are. Is that mechanism pushes you to become a better citizen? The authorities insist this program will allow them to improve security for citizens. A lot of camera keep the safety is really good. We can accept it. The system is run on continuous surveillance, paired with a series of digital blacklists. Currently, the backbone of the system is a set of blacklists, reportedly more than a dozen of which exist at the national level. Thanks to advances in artificial intelligence and facial recognition, punishable offenses include things like playing video games for too long, or wasting money on frivolous purchases, or posting unapproved thoughts on social media. But we'll get to that in a minute. The system officially began rolling out test pilots in 2014, and the country has since deployed millions of CCTV surveillance cameras. As of 2019, eight out of the ten most surveilled cities in the world are now located in China. Chongqing, considered the world's most surveilled city on the planet, boasts some 2.58 million CCTV cameras. That's one for every six citizens. 
30 times the number of cameras that are found currently in Washington, D.C. And we focus a lot on the repressive aspects of this, right? They use surveillance, gate recognition technology, face recognition technology, su uh, suppression of dissidents in Xinjiang and all these things. The other half of it is it's not just about making dissidents' lives harder, it's about making everyone else's lives better. <laughs> In other words, every person's every move in public is being watched pretty much all the time. And it plans to have more than 600 million installed by 2020. But this isn't just about surveillance. It's surveillance paired with AI and facial recognition, which has also been rolled out all over the place. Chinese people are using their faces to access everything from apps to ATMs to getting on planes and subways to entering into school and office buildings to paying for their fast food. This KFC in Beijing, you can even use your face to get meal recommendations. All with their face. The room is filmed real-time. The grid you see here is analyzing my face. Our cameras can now recognize me, even from the side or when my head rotates 30 degrees to the left or right, or 15 degrees up or down. And that's just a start. Police are walking around like it's Minority Report, wearing sunglasses with built-in facial recognition, scanning everyone for, quote, persons of interest. What look like metal detectors. Right. But they're actually, uh, like, they've got cameras on either side. In several cities, including Shenzhen, Authorities have launched facial recognition systems that recognize jaywalkers, then splash their faces on giant screens looming over the streets in an effort to shame them before sending them a fine to their phone. At some street corners, an alarm is even sounded when the jaywalker steps off the sidewalk so that the moment their face is captured by the system will look even more ridiculous, kind of like what a theme park roller coaster cam might capture. The system doesn't just post the embarrassing moment, it also posts the person's name and identification number, and in some reports I saw, a person's address was even listed under their face as well. AI and facial recognition has also been rolled out in Chinese schools. Some have launched facial recognition programs that go well beyond monitoring for attendance. They also scan students' engagement and behavior in the classroom in real time. The system, dubbed the Intelligent Classroom Behavior Management System, scans the entire class every 30 seconds repeatedly all day long looking for facial expressions it can categorize as neutral, happy, sad, scared, disappointed, angry, or surprised. Certain behaviors are also analyzed, such as how many times a student raises their hand, whether or not they're reading or writing, and if they're listening or not. Obviously, all of this gets the young children ready for the digital panopticon they are going to grow up into. Every person's behavior is tracked not just in public, but also online. In 2018, the New York Times announced that Google was reportedly building China a special censored search engine. In a first for any country anywhere, Beginning December 1st, 2019, new legislation in China will require all citizens to use facial recognition in order to sign up for internet services or to get a new cell phone number. And residents will also be banned from transferring their numbers to someone else. Obviously, all of this makes it much easier to verify people online and track and trace them. All of this surveillance and AI is being used to assign China's residents with their social credit score which goes up and down based on digitally tracked and traced behaviors that are being analyzed throughout the day. The government says this system will, quote, purify society and create a socially credible environment by rewarding people that the government deems trustworthy and punishing those who aren't. People with higher scores will have access to nicer housing, improved health care, more travel options, and better schools to send their children to. China's biggest dating website has also agreed to boost the profiles of people with high scores so they can get more dates. High rankers also receive discounts on their energy bills, and they don't have to pay deposits on things like upscale hotel rooms and other rentals. They also get better interest rates on loans, like putting a kid's drawing up on the fridge 
Citizens with high rankings who do good things also get posted on community boards and are given prizes like trophies. People with lower scores, however, it's something straight out of a Black Mirror episode where the digital world takes over reality and imparts real life consequences. Bad score means public shame and worse. Huang Hui Jun lost a court case and didn't pay. Now he's on a government blacklist. I can't buy airplane or train tickets, he says. Leo is a journalist who was ordered by a court to apologize for a series of tweets he wrote and was then told his apology was insincere. I can't buy property. My child can't go to private school, he says. Hong Shun Kwai is a former magazine editor who was ousted by the government. He feels like he's under constant surveillance. Being discredited makes it hard to get a job. Who scrapes by writing for an online publication? His investigative reports are on hold. In August 2013, he was detained without trial after exposing a senior party member's links with illegal prostitution. This is a recreation based on whose accounts. How far into people's daily mundane activities does this go? The government and the people running the plan would like to go as deeply as possible to determine how to allocate benefits and also how to uh, impact and shape their behavior. You feel you're being controlled by the list all the time. Over the course of a year, he was interrogated more than 70 times. Also how to uh, impact and shape their behavior. And there are so many ways to get your score lowered. Everything from not paying bills on time or traffic fines on time to political dissidents against the party, which includes a lot of things, counts against a person's score. So far, China's digital social credit score system has physically blocked people from taking over 11 million flights and 4 million train trips. People who are ranked into the lowest category, known as Lao Lai, probably not pronouncing that right, are forced to take special slow trains and sit in the lowest classes of those slow trains. The children of people with lower scores have been banned from attending better schools. People with low scores are kept out of the best hotels. And the government encourages businesses to consult with the blacklist before they hire people. So low scores also mean crappy jobs. People with low scores can't apply for credit. They're required to pay higher prices and deposits on certain things. They're even given slower internet speeds. They're barred from buying certain high-end products until their scores are raised. And some cities are even enforcing special credit systems specifically for dog owners. And points are deducted if they're caught not using a leash, or if their dog causes a public nuisance or barks too much. They lose too many points and these people get their dog taken away. But it doesn't even remotely stop there. The Chinese social media platform WeChat, the company's most popular instant messaging platform, even includes a map app that alerts citizens when they're within 500 meters of anyone deemed a lao lai at any given time. Tapping on a person's name offers up their personal information, their address, all of that, And the app actually encourages and allows people to identify debtors in public and then tattle on them if they see that person buying something using money that they should be paying their debts with instead. And as if that wasn't enough, it has even been reported that people with debt issues are required to have a ringtone on their cell phone, which sounds like a siren going off which is accompanied by a verbal warning to the person calling that person that they should be careful in their business dealings with the phone's owner because of his or her low social credit score, which further identifies and publicly shames people with lower scores. Of one Chinese journalist who was forced to spend a year in jail for, quote, fabricating and spreading rumors after reporting on the shady dealings of a vice mayor, Wired reported that he effectively became a second-class citizen who was banned from most forms of travel, could only book the lowest classes of seat on the slowest trains, couldn't buy certain consumer goods, stay at luxury hotels, or get any bank loans. Worse still, the blacklist is public. And as we've seen in the implementation of other computer-run systems just like this the world over, Mistakes go uncorrected all the time. 
and points can be lowered for a lot more reasons. I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's seemingly endless how many ways they can lower your points in this system. Points are lowered for discussing alternate versions of the government's official history of events online, posting political opinions without permission, or just generally posting any information that might in any way embarrass the government, no matter how true that information is. And apparently people's scores have been lowered even just for being friends with someone else who does any of those things. So that means that people will actually have to start deciding if they like their privileges in, in society more than they like being honest or having friends who are honest. Having to choose between social credit and social exile. Between being able to freely travel or freely think. As tech entrepreneur Rick Falkvinge of Private Internet Access wrote back in 2015, what China is doing here is selectively breeding its population to select against the trait of critical independent thinking. Now he says this may not be on purpose. <laughs> He says, it's nevertheless the effect of giving only obedient people the social ability to have successful children. And neighbors better get along too, because if they don't, their points get lowered. Information collectors like Joe I. Ni are paid to report on their neighbors, per quota, 10 entries a month. And their personal business gets splashed all over community boards for everyone else to see and then publicly shame them. <laughs> While some people might say it's good if shame gets people to behave better, please realize that the lesson imparted here really isn't about the value of being a decent person of high character and moral values. Instead, it's about living under constant fear constant tyrannical surveillance, being afraid of public scrutiny and shame while sucking up to authority and the government. Which just reminds me of all those North Koreans fake crying over Kim Jong-il's death because they were afraid of being punished if they didn't. And the whole system is set up so that once your points start going down, you start to spiral downward. As Wired reports, first your score drops, then your friends hear you're on the blacklist and fearful that their scores might be affected, they quietly drop you as a contact. The algorithm then notices that, your score plummets further. You can see how this just keeps going. The system has also been used to target specific ethnic and religious groups under claims that the government is countering separatism and terrorism. The uh, facial scanning in, in places like Xinjiang where they're very worried about religious uprisings. But intense surveillance of facial scans have been implemented everywhere from grocery stores to gas stations in areas where China's ethnic minority Muslim population resides. And it's now been estimated that over a million of these residents have been put into Chinese re-education camps and the clips that the Chinese government has allowed to come out of this, even in the good light they try to show it, are just horrifying. China has begun taking a few selected journalists inside. This is what it wants the world to see. Offered up as proof that these are not prisoners, but students willingly being guided away from extremism. Is it your choice to be here? Uh, 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 and the ways to earn credit it's not just paying one's bills on time and refraining from jaywalking. In 2018, China's rubber stamp parliament of loyal party members removed presidential term limits, allowing President Xi Jinping to remain president indefinitely. And it's a good thing, too, because the government's publicity department has released a new app called Studying the Great Nation, which is built around allowing citizens to do all of their daily business and communications through this government app while they earn points by watching videos of the president reading stories about him 
and taking quizzes on government information and party doctrine. The most popular app in China these days is not TikTok or WeChat, but rather a mobile application called Studying the Great Nation. So as soon as you install this app, you will ask for access to your phone's photo, videos, and also your contacts. Uh, the app itself feels like a love child between WeChat, Google Calendar, and Xi Jinping Thought. Uh, you can schedule a meeting, a video conference, or send your colleagues a message. But the most prominent feature is China's president. The app highlights the most important stories for users to study. Of course, all of the stories are about President Xi Jinping. And as the South China Morning Post reported, people are even gaming the system using the desktop version of the app to play videos of the president all night in the background in their own homes, so they can earn more points. Another useful tip is to use the、uh, desktop version、uh, of the app and click open a bunch of President Xi video and let them play in the background. That way, you can score a lot of points. So there we go. A rather effortless way to immerse yourself in party doctrine. I mean, why allow the government to wash your brain when people can just be induced with points to brainwash themselves? Studying the Great Nation has quickly become the most popular app in China, reportedly. And the thing is, is there's no getting out of this as a Chinese citizen. Everyone there is under constant surveillance to the point that while posting something controversial on social media at this point would be considered reckless, not posting at all in an effort to just avoid the system altogether would also look suspicious. So in that way, everyone's going to be required to participate in this. The Daily Bell put it succinctly: eventually, everyone will mimic the behavior that the government rewards. And they will create a new citizen. Dear passengers, people who travel without tickets or behave disorderly or smoke in public areas will be punished according to regulations, and the behavior will be recorded in the individual credit information system. To avoid any negative record of personal credit, please follow the relevant regulations and help with the orders on the train. The social credit system isn't even fully off the ground yet, and it's been used in so many ways. It's hard to list them all. This is just the beginning. It hasn't even officially fully started yet. To get toilet paper, tourists now have to stand facing this facial recognition dispenser. The rule is simple: no more than three sheets per person. 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 And I read article after article. People are doing all kinds of things. They're Donating their time for points, they're donating their blood for points, which is apparently worth five points. Just by the way, in one village, it was reported that people were told the government would give them points for donating money to charity. To raise his score, Zhang gets in line at a local community office to donate money. The government says will go to charity. Donate 一百不知道啊，再有捐一千的、六百的、五百的都有。I mean, think about that just for a second. In a system like that, points aren't even earned; they're technically just bought. Now, through doing good things, through this donation, or the giving of money, I'm now buying a ticket to the train. I'm now buying a ticket to the train. One could easily see the wealth gap take on a whole new dimension, where the social credit system essentially works to keep poor people down while becoming little more than a playground for the wealthy. And this is what happens after people have been fed into a system of continuous data transfer, where they've gotten more and more used to freely and continuously giving up their data in the name of safety and convenience. A system where they've now taken everyone's data and openly exploited and weaponized it. The futuristic technological Hegelian dialectic economic hybrid of capitalism and communism is unfolding before our eyes like something out of George Orwell's dizziest nightmares. Tourists now have to stand facing this facial recognition dispenser. No more than three sheets per person. And the thing is, is we're already seeing the infrastructure for this system being rolled out across the rest of the world. In the background of all the upheaval, for example, Chinese telecoms giant ZTE is currently helping Venezuela build its own Chinese-style social credit system, 
Earlier this year, the European Parliament, which represents all EU citizens, has approved the creation of one of the world's largest biometric databases. Employees in Sweden are voluntarily microchipping themselves now just for access to things at their workplace. India has been running the world's largest biometric ID program experiment, where people have to scan their fingerprints to receive their subsistence rations. And it's now being reported that some citizens who the AI system has failed to recognize by their fingerprints have reportedly starved to death. Countries like France that have passed anti-mask laws have made it illegal now to hide or cover one's face in public, which seems unrelated at first glance back when it happened in 2010, but ultimately that 2010 law will now make the deployment of facial recognition systems that much more effective down the road, as it was recently announced that France is in the process of rolling out a nationwide facial recognition ID program. Although the French government has preemptively promised not to use it to, quote, keep tabs on its citizens the way that China does, I would add for now. The problem is, is that once it's in place, there won't be much stopping them from making the decision to do so in the future. Earlier this year in London, a city that's already swarming with CCTV cameras every single place you look, the police trialed live facial recognition technology throughout the city, and one man tried to pull his jumper over his face and put his head down to avoid being scanned, so police swarmed him and demanded his identification. He promptly told the cops to piss off, so they gave him a 90-pound public order fine for swearing. After the story went viral in the media, the Metropolitan Police released a statement ridiculously claiming that anyone who declines to be scanned will not necessarily be viewed as suspicious. As the tech becomes more entrenched, the system is slowly creeping in all over the place. Here in America, we've already seen companies releasing systems to monitor and track employees throughout their workday. Future of office life, high tech tracking devices that can monitor your entire day on the job. And just like a Fitbit, it's with you all day long. The same ID badge that opens office doors can now track your every move and more. We're essentially able to augment those ID badges to figure out in real time really what people are doing at work. Major cities like San Diego have deployed networks of smart lights in the name of safety and efficiency. Those aren't just new lights, they're smart lights. A sophisticated array of LED fixtures with built-in sensors and cameras connected over a wireless network. Police have been tapping into networks of ring surveillance camera doorbells in an effort to monitor neighborhoods throughout the country. And government agencies and companies alike have been checking people's social media profiles as part of job application processes for years now. In fact, earlier this year, some insurance companies were approved to start evaluating customer social media feeds when setting their premium rates. And we already know getting banned by companies like Uber or Airbnb can limit a person's ability to travel if that's the way they do it. As Wired notes, most Americans have dozens of scores, many of them drawn from behavioral and demographic metrics similar to those used in China, and most of them held by companies that give us no chance to opt out. In 2012, Facebook patented a method of credit assessment that could consider the credit scores of people in someone's Facebook network. The patent described a tool that arrives at an average credit score for someone based on their Facebook friends and rejects a loan application if the average is below a certain minimum. So Facebook has already been thinking about this years ago. It says, you could imagine a future where people are watching to see if their friend's credit is dropping and then dropping their friends if that would affect them, says Frank Pasquale, a data expert at University of Maryland Carey School of Law. That's terrifying. Facebook, for its part, claims that it just comes up with these patents. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to use them, but the fact that it has it at all should tell you something. I mean, the, the bottom line here is there's an extrajudicial system that's being built out of Silicon Valley that cares nothing for traditional due process and legal rights because it can go around them. Earlier this year, Fast Company's Mike Elgin wrote, an increasing number of societal privileges related to transportation, accommodations, communications, and the rates we pay for services are either controlled by technology companies or affected by how we use technology services. And Silicon Valley's rules for being allowed to use their services are getting stricter. 
If current trends hold, it's possible that in the future, a majority of misdemeanors and even some felonies will be punished not by Washington, D.C., but by Silicon Valley. It's a slippery slope away from democracy and towards corporatocracy. In the future, law enforcement may be determined less by the Constitution and legal code and more by end-user license agreements. These systems that are being put in place are like giant one-way mirrors being held up to society because as citizens, especially here in America, it's impossible to challenge the assessments of us when algorithms are proprietary secrets, first of all, and we're not even allowed to know how our friendly data brokers are rating us or even how many assessments on us exist at this point. We don't even know. On top of that, people are now willingly covering their own homes and surveillance cameras and these always listening smart speaker devices that are linked to these same companies. I mean, essentially technology is slowly grooming the very concept of privacy out of modern humanity altogether. And while governments and companies are spying on us, spying on ourselves, on a global scale, billionaires like Bill Gates are investing in the rollout of worldwide camera systems that will record and monitor the entire planet in real time. Cameras which can zero in on any location on Earth and just beam live video streams. <laughs> Supposedly this is going to help fight forest fires and illegal fishing operations, but I mean, come on, they're turning this place into one giant high-tech panopticon. And the AI, we're told, just keeps getting smarter. Now you have companies like IBM who've deployed artificial intelligence programs that can predict with 95% accuracy whether or not an employee is likely to quit, thereby endowing human resource managers with a sort of mind reading ability they can use to attempt to engage and keep said employee from quitting. Stores like Walgreens have admitted they're testing out smart cooler systems with iris tracking capabilities that will scan shoppers' faces and analyze them to make inferences on their age and gender and other data in order to more precisely target them with products. Malls in Canada are using similar shopper tracking systems. And incentive programs which trade data for a little savings up front, like when Whole Foods scans Amazon Prime shoppers' accounts for an additional 10% off sale items at the register, then use all of that data in much the same way for future targeted marketing campaigns. But the bottom line is that all of this data that we're constantly putting out all day long when we move to and fro, everything that we do and engage in here is creating a digital footprint of where someone has been in the real world and what they did while they were there. And it's only 2019, so we've only just begun to glimpse how far such technology might go. Back in 2016, Washington Post reported on an Israeli startup which claims its technology can take one look at a person's face and realize character traits that are undetectable to the human eye. The company is called Faceception, and it announced that it had already signed a contract with the Homeland Security Agency to help identify terrorists, of course. But, quote, the company said its technology can also be used to identify everything from great poker players to extroverts, pedophiles, geniuses, and white-collar criminals, we understand the human much better than other humans understand each other, said Faceception Chief Executive Shai Gilboa. Our personality is determined by our DNA and reflected in our face. It's a kind of signal. I mean, if that's not neo-eugenics, I don't know what is. And just like in China, schools here in the U.S. have begun rolling out facial recognition software in the name of safety and for measuring student engagement, quote unquote. Even Taylor Swift is now deploying facial recognition at concerts, reportedly to ward off stalkers. And here in the United States, facial recognition is being embedded into society without safeguards for privacy or regulations on how companies can and can't use this data. In fact, it was just reported back in September that Jeff Bezos says that Amazon is writing its own facial recognition laws in the tech giant's hope that federal lawmakers will adopt much of its draft legislation on facial recognition regulations. In other words, it's a total joke. Bear in mind that our society still hasn't even solved basic issues like poverty, 
the ever-widening wealth gap and inequality, homelessness, deficient health care, unemployment, government corruption, I don't know, the list goes on and on and on. Nothing about these systems appears to be aimed at doing anything about these major societal issues we face either. I mean, it's pretty clear that the ultimate goal here is not liberation through technology, the way they were promising it back in the 50s and 60s, but more of an Orwellian digital panopticon level control in the name of safety and convenience. These high-tech tracking and tracing systems allow whoever's in charge to define what desirable and undesirable behavior is, and then attempt to modify people, whether or not that's the Chinese government or major Silicon Valley firms. We've already seen this happening with the censorship of controversial opinions everywhere from social media outlets to the takedown of books and films from tech giant Amazon. I mean, ultimately, this is about the modification of a person's thoughts and beliefs and engineering of their behavior and thus control over people's reality. The gamification of society isn't news or even new. We've been prodded in this direction my entire life anyway decades now, in the form of video games, financial credit scores, frequent flyer mile programs, shopper points, loyalty reward systems. But the question remains, what happens when the game becomes so enmeshed in real life that no one is allowed to stop playing? Where everything a person does in modern society, every interaction both online and off, is tracked, traced, and then rewarded or punished. And who gets to make up the rules of the game that we should all be forced to play by? It sounds really cool for a theme park ride. You're all like, yeah, wow, cool, man, I want my turn. But after you go around the block once or twice, you think, I've seen this movie, it's 2001. I'm sorry, Dave. Logan's Run, The Wizard of Oz, it's Rollerball, it's The Hunger Games, Gattaca, 1984, Brave New World, Divergent, Soylent Green, etc. I've seen that movie, I've actually seen all those movies. And you realize one fatal flaw. What happens if they don't like what I say? And what happens if I don't like or believe in what they do anymore? What about my rights, man? There's no guarantee of freedom or absolute respect of rights. And you're just another, basically, head of cattle in the global management system. And everything shifts according to what is already acceptable and what certain people wish to make acceptable. And it's always between those lines. The theme park ride would become torture rather than entertainment if you were never allowed off of it. Just because we have technology doesn't mean a system like this will prevail and that the whole thing isn't setting itself up for its own demise. The only way a system like this can work is if the majority continues to go along with what has been put in place by a tiny elite minority. History has repeatedly shown there's no greater tool for liberation than a system of total oppression. And just because it comes now packaged with the slick veneer of machine intelligence and high-definition video doesn't really change that. 